Okay, so we're going to start with the C programming language and assembly. And uh, I'm going to always, I always start my classes with motivation because unless you're motivated to learn this stuff, you're not going to learn it. So uh, when you are stuck in the middle of your problems and you sort of are frustrated, I want you to go back and think about the motivation for learning this stuff and hopefully that'll get you through. Um, so why are we looking at C? I you know there's, there's all these new hot programming languages. C is never one of those. C is always not the new hotness. Like I think uh, the programming language of the year this year is Go, and then before that it was Python or Java and like. But you know C, we're still teaching it, and it's still everywhere. Like, in fact, I would bet uh, if you go through your entire career and never see a C program outside of this class, I'll buy you a, I'll buy you around somewhere, <laughs> because. Uh, sure enough, even though C is never going to be the, the, the new hot programming language, it's still there. And it's still being used in really critical places. And so at, the, you know, at worst, you'll be able to, to read C programs that are, that are running critical systems and be able to analyze them, um, hopefully. Okay, so compared to other high-level languages, um, why would you use C instead of, for example, Python? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's a good quote. Yeah, because it's very close to assembly language. So that's why people, they look at Python, they look at Java, and they're like, yeah, those are beautifully written. Those programs give you just the best sort of abstractions and features. And, you know, it's got garbage collection. It's got, you know, all these sorts of different uh, features that make it easier to program. Yet, the, the reason why you would choose C is typically performance, because those things cost you. The fact that you don't manage your own memory, yeah, that's great, uh, but there's an overhead associated with that. So in Java, the fact that you don't track your, your classes necessarily and you don't have to clean up after yourself, yeah, somebody does. <laughs> and that's the runtime. And the runtime is sitting there, oh gosh, I gotta wake up and garbage collect again. That's the reason why people are using still using C. Like you still want, there are certain situations where you really care about the performance. And if you know how to program C properly, you can get that performance out of C without the negative drawbacks. Okay. So it provides a very minimal set of abstractions compared to the other high level languages on top of the hardware. So this is a beautiful assembly programming, uh, programming language is basically uh, what, what it is. Um, so high-level languages often make your programming simpler at the expense of efficiency. Um, one example of this, and I'll go on a tangent, is people love JavaScript, but the JavaScript runtime is like 20 megabytes. And yeah, you get a lot of cool things out of JavaScript, but like a different programming language that doesn't support those things can give you a runtime that's smaller. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, compared to assembly programming, so. Uh, there won't be a lot of assembly programming here. There'll be a small assembly uh, uh, assignment. Um, but compared to assembly programming, it gives you just enough abstractions for you to not be painfully working with hardware registers and hardware instructions. So it abstracts the hardware just enough so that it makes it easy to program the hardware. So for example, uh, you don't access hardware registers directly. Um, you do, you can access memory addresses, but you have an abstraction for, for manip manipulating um, addresses. Um, and it provides you other things like your function variables, or variables, functions, arrays, uh, and then uh, arithmetic and Boolean expressions. So it's giving you um, an abstraction on top of those hardware features and then building these abstractions on top of it. But they're very minimal compared to some of the other programming. Um, so, and it's used prevalently. So here is a list of things that, is, that are mainly using C or C++. Like some of these things, like uh, a lot of web browsers are using a lot of C++. But you see operating systems, web servers, browsers, mail servers, DNS servers, video games, C, C++. Um, a lot of these office apps and, and the graphics card programming. They're all using, a lot of them are using variants of C in a low-level program. And the reason why is performance, uh, portability, the wealth of programmers in code, although you know, people are stopping teaching C, <laughs> but not us. Uh, 
and then they're used in all these applications. Um, and so you'll see, uh, for example, here is a very uh, significant bug in uh, Apple's OpenSSL or, open, or Apple's SSL bug. And you see, this is a C error, and it's got an extra go to fail in it. And so the ability to parse this code base and understand that, oh, this actually shouldn't be there, and to understand the failure states that that results in, uh, knowledge of C is necessary. And so when you have a large code base that's based in C and you're auditing the, the, the code, uh, you'll find that, the, that knowing C is helpful. So this is in 2014. Uh, Heartbleed is another one. Uh, the protocol for TLS, which is a uh, variant of SSL, uh, that's also written in C. Uh, and then, so the, the Heartbleed bug was this thing that didn't validate this payload link that came back in this protocol. So the XKC, so you know it's bad when XKCD makes a cartoon out of you. Uh, so if you read the XKCD cartoon, this is basically the exploit in a nutshell. Uh, there's this protocol that does an echo, and you say, hey, uh, uh, are you still there? Reply bird, and bird has four letters. And it says, okay, bird, and it tells you bird, four letters. Uh, but then if you say, uh, are you still there? Reply hat with 500 letters. It will reply hat with 500 bytes that are beyond that. Now this is a bug that's in your C program that you have to understand. And this is, this is the, 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 uh, the bug right here in five lines. You're parsing this payload and the payload, uh, the payload thing is the link field that you parse from the adversary potentially. And this payload field is the field that you use to memory copy from one buffer into the next. And this is never checked, this payload. And so this is something, memcopy is a C library call that you'll learn about uh, next class. So by going straight from this to this, you'll see that because this never got bounds checked, you can you just trust whatever that, was, that payload was, and it gives you the entire length of whatever you asked for. So if you asked for 50,000 letters, it would give you the memory image, the 50,000 bytes beyond the memory space of where this word was stored. And in particular, if you did this enough time, you could get the secret keys of the web server. So this, the web server protected by TLS has got these certificates that are supposed to be secret. But it's up there in your, it's memory space. And so this is a memory overrun that gives you all the secrets of the, of the web server and allows you to break it. So again, these are things, uh, eventually at the end of this course, you'll hopefully be able to see how some of this stuff works in assembly uh, to, to be able to understand this exploit. So again, this is C. Um, why assembly? Um, so I want you in this course to learn how the programs uh, that you write are mapped into the underlying hardware. Um, so this allows you to write efficient code. So you can avoid certain uh, code patterns that are high overhead, for example. Um, and so the other thing I want you to do is to understand how both the programming language and the CPU architecture can combine to make you have very difficult security problems. So one of the things I'm going to preach at you this quarter is that C, along with x86, have uniquely given us a whole slew of security problems and how a different programming language, a different systems programming language might be able to help Towards the end of this course, hopefully I'll introduce you to other ways of doing things that are non-C based. And I'll talk about how uh, newer versions of x86 processors can help alleviate the security uh, issues. So that's one of the things I focus on uh, is computer security. So a lot of the stuff that you'll see here has a computer security focus just because of that. Um, another reason to use assembly that's not security uh, related <laughs> is to enable platform specific tasks. Um, uh, specifically, Intel, every year or two, is updating its CPU processor uh, line. And typically, every new update adds a whole slew of new instructions. And these new instructions are basically to accelerate the most commonly used uh, features. So for example, uh, people were using AES, which is this encryption standard. I know this is a security example again, but uh, it works for non-security examples. Uh, they were like, oh, everything is doing AES. Why don't I create a single instruction that does an AES round? That's what they did. Now, in order for you to leverage that new instruction, you typically need to hand code assembly initially. 
because your compiler uh, is very slow to update itself for any new processor instructions. So for the latest CPU, you basically have to hand code the assembly and then, and then get, get access to those new instructions. So that, again, you'll have your C program and then eventually you want to embed assembly to get the processor specific instructions. That's something that we'll be doing in this class that you'll be able to do at the end of this class. Um, so the difficulty with Python is that it's running through an interpreter and it's running through a sort of a different kind of uh, uh, machine state. Like different. So uh, for C programs, yes, you can write your C program and we'll get this uh, sort of towards the end of this class. Uh, you write your C program and if you have some embedded assembly you want to just drop into your C program, there's a mechanism for you to do so while hooking into your C, your, your outer C constructs, because your C, your C program is still using variables and stuff, and you're dropping into assembly code and getting access to the registers, well, there's some piping that needs to happen. I only know that piping in C. I don't know the piping in C++. I would imagine you can do it in C++. Anything that compiles directly into um, object code that runs uh, on the bare metal, you should be able to embed assembly instruction or assembly code. Uh, something like Python that goes into basically bytecode uh, and is interpreted. Yeah, that doesn't work. Um, yeah. Can I ask, what's the difference between an assembly language and non-assembly language? Um, so you have the processor itself running bare metal instructions that work on hardware registers and hardware memory, loca or memory locations. Mm -hmm. That is typically what assembly sort of code or object code is. Assembly code is sort of like a text representation of the object code. What would be an example of language that's assembly and not assembly? Uh, so the difference is uh, a scripting language is typically interpreted or compiled into like byte codes of so Java, mm -hmm. Python, Perl, uh, those kinds of scripting languages. Uh, you're, there's usually a, an interpreter. Actually, I might have a slide on this later. But the interpreter runs natively. And then it's parsing that and keeping a virtual machine state, sort of, to execute that program. In C, and in C++, you compile that program all the way down into the hardware <laughs> object code. And that thing only runs on the hardware that you compiled it on. So the thing with Python is that you can take your Python script, you can put it all over. You can take your Python script, run it on Windows, run it on, on Linux. And what changes is that the interpreter, the Python interpreter, is running natively either on Windows, on Linux, and it's interpreting that script and creating this sort of intermediate machine representation that sort of, um, that's independent. So that's the difference between interpreted languages versus things that are compiled. And because C is compiled, it runs on bare metal, runs fast. Because Python and Java are sort of interpreted, um, in their default mode, they're running this interpreted bytecode and they're creating an independent machine state on top of the bare metal machine state. They're typically a little slower. Now, the um, I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's just-in-time compilation. They call it a JIT. You would take that bytecode and you say, I actually want to compile all the way down to machine code. There are some pieces of software that allow you to go all the way down from the interpreted machine code all the way down to bare metal. Uh, typically not, unless you explicitly say, I want to get this down to machine code. Um, uh, Python's got this compiled Python, uh, and that gives you one step towards it. But uh, yeah, typically you would need, um, so here's an example from Google just this week. Uh, Google says, uh, you know, Python is too slow for me. Like the front end of YouTube is all Python. And uh, they've got this programming language called Go. And Go will compile all the way down to bare metal. Uh, and so what they're, they're, what they're doing is they're like, I'm going to write a transpiler that takes all this Python code, puts it into Go, so that Go can eventually go to, to machine code. Um, there is some of that in Python where you can compile it down, uh, but they want to they sort of move everything to Go and then have Go sort of compile it down. So 
that's why Go is like the programming language of the year because Google said so, and they, and they're running with it and they're actually uh, they call that transpiling because you're going from a high level language to another high level language. When we talk about compiling, you're taking a high level language and going all the way down to bare metal, all the way down to the object code. Um, and so, okay. Any other questions? No, they're using this thing called Grumpy. And I would be Grumpy too if I had to, t had to translate Python code into Go. Yeah, I'd be Grumpy too. Uh, I don't know why they called it Grumpy. Me neither. I, I think it's it's like Alphaware. It's not working very well right now. They just released it. Uh, but um, I will not. So, th so there are two. There are two things on the horizon for systems programmers. So this is, when we're, we're taking this course, we're talking mostly about system programming. There are two programming languages that are sort of the next hotness in system programming. One is Go, the other is Rust. And so uh, Rust in particular is a completely new way to think about programming. So I might do a lecture at the very end if I have time on if you start a new project and you don't want any of the shenanigans that you'll see in C that I'm going to show you, you might want to do Rust. And so hopefully this quarter will give you an exposure to C and assembly that will allow you to consider new programming languages better, give you a framework for understanding why you would change programming languages uh, when you're implementing something new. So I think we have a project here at Portland State they're trying to re-implement a bunch of the operating systems using Rust. I think Bart Massey, you guys know Bart? Bart Massey is a, is a professor here. He's trying to write more code in Rust just because of the potential it has to be uh, a replacement for C. Um, Rust is uh, from Mozilla, I believe. Yeah. And so like on the Rust community, they say a lot of stuff and they want to get it off their plate. And yeah. And uh, Rust, uh, that name seems to be like a big memory thing. And so people might think about Rust as a memory thing. Yes. Memory safety, and you'll get this. In fact, your a lot of your reverse engineering homework has to do with memory corruption bugs. So if you write your stuff in Rust, if I wrote all my CTF levels in Rust, you would have no homework. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the power of changing a programming language. Uh, but the syntax of Rust, uh, yeah, you, it's, 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 yeah, it's basically. We're pretty good in this department about functional programming languages. I think some of you will find out if you take more of the advanced courses, uh, functional programming is sort of the, the way you get memory safety. And memory safety is the biggest problem in C. Like all of your Internet of Things devices that are getting rooted left and right, memory corruption bugs are, well, default credentials and memory corruption errors are two of the biggest reasons for that. And so if you do something with Rust, you can get rid of the Weak from memory corruption errors, uh, but you can't get rid of the human problems and the default credentials. So, yeah. All right, that's another that's another uh, uh, digression. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, the other reason you would want assembly is that a lot of times when you're interfa interfacing with your hardware devices, so if you have a new uh, hardware device in your system and you want to write a driver for it, you're typically writing assembly code to inter interact with your with your device. Um, <clears throat> What's it? Especially video codecs, right? Like video codec, yeah. So anything that requires direct access to your hardware, you would typically run, uh, run those directly with, with hardware instructions. Uh, another reason for using assembly, and this is the reason why I got into it, is to reverse, uh, reverse engineer unknown binary code. And you'll get a lot of practice with this for, your, for the meta CTF uh, homeworks. So you want to identify what viruses, spyware, rootkits, and other malware is doing um, to to, to figure out is this malicious or not. And in this day and age, uh, there's a lot of software that we're running on our systems that we don't know the origin for. Like how do you know that the thing that you downloaded on your phone doesn't have something malicious in it? Well, the way you find out is you reverse engineer the, the binary blob and you analyze it. Um, and so that's the reason why you would need to know the underlying hardware, the assembly code uh, language. And the reason I got into this was because I wanted to understand how cheats and online games worked. And all of those are binary blobs that tamper with the game. And so the idea is, well, if you want to catch those cheats, well, how do you figure out 
uh, how they've tampered with that, that program state, you need assembly code for that. So. Okay, so here's an example. The FBI playpen uh, case. This is actually going through the legal system still. Uh, it's not sure, they're not sure whether or not this is actually something that's legal in this country to do. The FBI thinks it should be. Um, in fact, uh, if you follow Ron Wyden, he is railing against this kind of software being distributed by the FBI. Um, so the uh, Tor exploit was basically an exploit in the browser. So uh, if you run Tor in the browser, Tor is this um, anonymizing network. And so if you want to run all your web stuff anonymously, then you would download Tor's browser bundle, and it's typically Mozilla with the Tor plugin in there. So what the FBI, the, so the Tor, unfortunately the Tor browser is being used for, I'm going to throw a wild number out there that's unsubstantiated, 80% illegitimate activity and 20% legitimate. That might be conservative. So, so of course, the law enforcement's like, we got to figure out a way to get, get into that browser. And so they figured out, they had a zero day on the Tor browser, and they used that, they captured one of these sites on the dark web, and they used that site to distribute this JavaScript file to take advantage of an exploit in the browser. And once it took advantage of that exploit, it dumped this payload. And this is basically, you see this in uh, ASCII encoded a binary blob in your JavaScript. So it issued this JavaScript that would deliver this payload. And if you look at this, it basically is a, this is the shell code. Wow, I need to replace that battery. This shell code basically, uh, if you reverse engineer it, will connect to this IP address over HTTP and send the local PC's host name and MAC address and IP address to uncloak the user of the browser. And this, um, this IP address, if you see who owns it, it's, it's located in Virginia, and it's owned by a company that's sort of like a shell company for like the, I think of the FBI. So this is how, when you see this, you can, yeah, it's helpful to reverse engineer it to be able to see that, yeah, this is what this piece of malware does, and I can identify it, and then I can attribute it to the FBI. So this would be something similar, like how do you attribute the DNC hack? Well, these are the kinds of things that you would want to look at in terms of where is this stuff going, where did it come from, these sorts of things. All right. Uh, yeah. uh, here's another example. So Stuxnet was a piece of software that we delivered to the Iranians to blow up their nuclear centrifuges. Uh, and so once this code got out there, people were like, oh, well, what, what does it do and who might have written it? And so that required them to pull out the binary blob and to understand the low-level function of this malware. And it turns out the, the, uh, this piece of software was so complex that the people reverse engineering uh, saw that it could not have been a single person that developed this, this malware. And it was only, only a nation state would have the resources to develop this specific payload. So then they were looking at attributing it and of course, eventually there's enough code snippets. And so we have enough monitors to figure out all the different kinds of binary blobs that are, that are appearing in different sort of, I guess, sensors, internet sensors. They trace this to the US and the Israelis. So again, here is the uh, reverse engineering sort of allowing you to do some sort of geopolitical attribution for malicious attacks. So in this day and age, this is like highly relevant, right? Like this year. Uh, so, again, having these skills is helpful uh, for this kind of work. Uh, here's one shell shock from a couple years ago. Um, this was a uh, bash bug that if you run anything with Linux and a out-of-date version of bash, which most things do have an out-of-date version of bash, and because people don't update these things very often, um, what was happening was people were getting these payloads, and these payloads were being <laughs> executed automatically on their on whatever Linux, uh, embedded Linux thing that they had on their DSL router or the, you know, the wireless routers, on, on any sort of internet of thing device that had a sort of a bash script in it. So uh, here's an example of a payload. And again, this is assembly code that by the end of this class, you'll be able to reverse engineer and figure out, oh, this is exactly what these instructions are doing. So this particular one puts a backdoor into your 
your uh, your distribution. Um, yeah, this, well, this particular one doesn't. I mean, but this is something when you look at this assembly code eventually, like towards the end point, when you get through chapter three, you'll be able to look at this and you say, I understand all of these calls, and I understand the system call that this thing is running. That's hopefully what. And it's important, right? Like you want to see when malware gets released in the wild, you want to see what it's doing, right? You don't want to uh, just cross your fingers and hope it doesn't do anything bad. Um, all right. So that is motivation. Is there any questions? Is that the full exploit? The full, this actually isn't the exploit itself. The exploit is actually text-based. That's how you uh, root the, the shell shock. And you don't have to know any assembly. But this is the payload you want to drop is a binary that you want to drop onto that system so that you can get a backdoor access to it. Yeah, so the warhead, we call it. The warhead was this thing to get you uh, the, the initial uh, ex you know, the beachhead, and then you would download something like this. But then this is the thing that you would want to reverse engineer. All right, um, so that's your motivation. 